Here we go for another walk through the outskirts of Beijing. It is uh, March 30th today and cold and wet. <laughs> Not fun uh, to be outside. But to be honest, for Beijing it's actually a good thing when it rains because there's a severe lack of rain in general in Beijing. It's very arid climate so rain's always good uh, for the surrounding farmland as well as for the city itself. Um, so this is uh, my second video in this format. See how it goes. I'm trying to adjust the camera angle to make it a bit more comfortable to watch. Uh, although I understand most people will probably just be listening to these kind of videos, which is uh, fine with me. Give me a thumbs up, give me a comment if you have any, any comments how to improve. Looking very much forward to conversation. Today, the topic, as in the title, I want to talk about whether and how China is or isn't going to profit or have benefits from the war in Ukraine or to be more general from the crisis around Ukraine. So I don't want to uh, focus on just the war because uh, when we say war in Ukraine, obviously people think first of all of the Russian invasion, the fighting that's going on, horrible, horrible pictures, people dying on both sides, horrible war crimes committed, uh, for example, by those um, militias killing prisoners of war, that Russians that they captured. Um, so, so this is just a part. I think if we take the big picture and the more long-term perspective, we have to talk not just about the fighting itself, but also the greater uh, response of, for example, NATO expansion, which was the main trigger for the war, as well as things like the Western response, the whole sanctions war that's now started, that's also started to expand towards China. Although uh, when Blinken, Anthony Blinken from the US announced the sanctions, he said they were about humanitarian issues, about human rights, so he didn't directly link it to Ukraine, but other voices in the US were saying, oh, China's supporting Russia, we have to sanction them. So, yeah, I think this response is much bigger than the war itself. I mean, the war is a humanitarian crisis, but from an economic perspective, it's very local, whereas the sanctions have ramifications for the global economy, so, so it's much bigger than that. And so if I talk about effects on China, benefits or not, then I definitely talk about the whole uh, system of events that's happening right now, uh, sanctions, uh, war, embargoes, etc. Um, here school has just ended, <laughs> quite some chaos. Let me show you the crossroads for a second. So this is what it looks like schools across the road here. Some people, some children, actually quite a lot, are walking home. However, others were picked up by cars, which leads to a traffic chaos. Um, I'm just navigating through right now. A lot of kids looking at me. There's still, I mean, there's some foreigners in Beijing. It's definitely more than in smaller places in China, but there's still a lot of curiosity about foreign faces. So people are looking at me. Uh, some of them say things like, oh, why Gore, which means uh, foreigner in Chinese. All right, back to the topic. So what I want to do is I try to be systematic in the answer about uh, benefits from the crisis. And I want to look at three time dimensions, basically the short term, mid term and long term effects. And I want to look at three distinct groups of Chinese society because as I mentioned last time as well, it's always silly to say China thinks or China does. It's a continental country with a population larger than Europe and the US combined. So obviously there's always different perspectives and situations. So what I will be looking at in terms of, of stakeholder or whatever you want to call them groups is to look at the government, the leadership, like Communist Party leadership of China I want to look at the, the corporations or business people, company owners, big and small, as well as the common people, you know, like the workers and farmers traditionally, employees, kind of the UME of society. Because I think there are quite uh, 
distinct differences in, in all these dimensions. So if we start in the short term, uh, the short term obviously is, is quite uh, challenging economically. Uh, there's a huge uncertainty and especially for the business community, this uncertainty is very negative, obviously. I mean, uh, people have done trade with Russia. China exports huge amounts of goods towards the US. So this uh, whole threat of sanctions, especially if the sanctions uh, will be expanded towards China, there would be more sanctions against China. That would be a huge scare. Also the effect on the stock market, although just these few days uh, the US stock market has been recovering, but who knows, right? The oil price is going up. All these um, disturbances really, that's the issue. And that's what in finance is always the thing. Uh, any situation the economy can cope with and find solutions, but uncertainty is the thing that worries people the most because you don't know where to invest. You don't know what will happen next. Is, is oil going to be missing? Is nickel missing? Are some other rare earths or whatever metals or whatever resources that came from Russia will not be available? So this uncertainty is, is, is a huge uh, issue for the business community, especially in the short run. And this also impacts the, the, the leadership so the Communist Party, probably unlike any other government, or at least unlike Western governments, is not legitimized through elections. But it's by no means an unlegitimate or illegitimate government. It's just the legitimacy of the Chinese government comes from its success in improving the people's lives. And there are numerous surveys from numerous uh, universities, including several American universities, and they all come to the conclusion that come to the conclusion that the uh, the Chinese government has a huge backing by the Chinese population. So that's not uh, propaganda. That's really also what you hear. Like talk to any Chinese, you know, they complain about the local government. They complain about individual policies and 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 issues that haven't been solved. But in general. And as uh, Kishor Mabubani says, I'll put a link in the description, uh, people's lives have, has improved so much over the last 40 years. He says the, the, the quality of life for the vast majority of people has improved more in the last 40 years than it ever has in the last 4,000 years. And in, in such a situation, it's only normal that people would be grateful and thankful for the government which was able to achieve it. So that as a short side note, what I'm trying to say is the legitimacy of the Chinese government comes from ensuring the quality of life for the people. So when uh, massive economic disturbances are on the horizon, that means heavy <laughs> workload for the government. So I'm sure like all officials that have to do with international trade, that have to do with the economic structure of China, they're working heavy hours at the moment, trying to, to hedge and to work out strategies to, to, to prepare for all possible uh, future developments. Uh, there is one concept that people should know if they care about Chinese economic policies. It's, it's the concept of dual circulation. If you haven't heard of it, look it up. Um, there's many experts who can explain it much better than me. The dual circulation concept very basically is saying there's the circulation of goods and, and, and finances across borders, meaning China exporting, importing goods and um, receiving or spending money cross border internationally, like globalization in a word. And then there's the second circulation, which is China internally. Now, for me as a Swiss, it doesn't make sense to talk of this as two circulations, but if you lead a continental country with 1.4 billion people, it actually makes a lot of sense to say either one can be important, they can be equally important, or in, in the developmental stage that China now is, definitely the trend is towards making the internal circulation, meaning the internal economy, more and more important for China's economy as a whole. So kind of 
getting rid of the dependency on exports. So China's development model for a while has depended on exports to get in uh, foreign currency, foreign technology, foreign investment, which then drives the economic development inside China. Now the focus is more and more towards the internal circulation, uh, use internal domestic investment, internal uh, own developed technologies to drive future economic growth, as well as internal consumption as a driver for, for economic growth. And I've seen recently a lot of talk in Chinese social media from Chinese experts, economists and, and strategy experts who say exactly that. So the internal circulation must be uh, sped up, must be focused on, must be invested more to really drive this uh, internal economic development because of the external uncertainty, also because of the worry that maybe the US will try the same thing they've done on, on Russia to try that also on China. Uh, so that's uh, some things that uh, political leaders, political experts are currently feverishly discussing. And for the common people, I think in the short term, uh, the thing they feel most is obviously like all around the world, the rising gas prices, gasoline. I mean, a lot of people don't drive themselves. Uh, there's a much less car ownership overall than in Western countries. Um, but truck drivers obviously need diesel fuel. Prices have gone up heavily. That impacts prices for everything because whatever's transported uh, needs gasoline. So yeah, so, so this is what common people mostly feel, uh, increasing prices for any consumer goods. And um, this worries people. Obviously a second worry is anyone that has anything to do with export oriented uh, business, they'll worry about jobs, job security, and the overall trend of the economy, this uncertainty, uh, everybody knows about this, so everybody's a bit on edge. Uh, though I have to say, I feel like common people in China, they have this massive trust in the government. So it's kind of like, yeah, we're worried, but somehow they'll figure it out. So that's kind of the sentiment as I would de describe it. Then if we look a bit more on the midterm perspective, let me just check that I don't uh, forget any important parts that I've been wanting to talk about. Yeah, I mean, in the midterm, the question is very much how the sanctions will, will pan out. Because at the moment, the vast majority of the world hasn't joined in the sanctions. We have to be very clear about this in the West. We have this feeling of the international community has isolated China, uh, Russia. And, um, you know, maybe China is the one rogue nation that supports Russia still. That's not the case. As I've said last time, India, South Africa, Brazil, Turkey, even the NATO member Turkey, Israel, all of Arabia, all of Africa, they all refuse to join in the sanctions. So in the midterm, if, if I say midterm, I mean like one, two years from now, the big question is how that will pan out. Because at the moment, the US has still a massive um, like secret weapon, which is the US dollar. That is the international currency, pretty much. Most international trade happens in US dollars. And sometimes the US is weaponizing this by just saying any transaction that is done in US dollars cannot, must not uh, be done with one of these countries. For example, Iran at the moment, that's what uh, got Huawei in trouble because they did a transaction um, through a US bank or through a bank with a <laughs> branch in the US uh, in US dollar and that's when the US said okay you violated our sanctions against Iran so so this is um, yeah a weaponization of the currency and this could lead to the majority of the world not being able to do trade with Russia anymore that's of course what the US is hoping for they really want to hurt Russia 
for yeah whatever reason be it to punish putin or to punish the population of russia whatever their fault was um but it's not certain that that works because for one russia is way more important in international economic in the international economic system than than for example iran obviously uh, iran has oil and some resources but russia has a lot of oil and a lot more different resources as well as a much more sophisticated technology and industry base uh, weapons technology medical technology uh, medical industry they have uh, they're just economically way more important than and of course food as well i think that's been a topic recently like food security so it's much harder to just cut out carve out russia from the international economic system so we'll have to see really because i i think what's been astounding is how fast and how many countries have announced to to start trading in other currencies than the us dollar and especially when it comes to oil trade um, for example india announcing that they will uh, buy gas and oil in, in ruble in the future. Um, this has been reason for wars for the US several times. When, when Saddam Hussein announced he wanted to sell oil uh, in, in Euro to the European Union, the US invaded Iraq when Muammar Gaddafi suggested a pan-African uh, currency uh, backed with uh, Libyan oil. The US and NATO bombed Libya. So, so, so to suggest to sell oil in a currency other than the US dollar, that's why we call it the petrodollar, that's been cause for war more than once. And um, so, so now not only does India buy oil from Russia in ruble, kind of in the shadow of this uh, Ukraine crisis, Saudi Arabia announced that they're considering selling oil to China in Chinese renminbi, which uh, again, I mean, it's not even directly connected to the Ukraine crisis because neither China nor Saudi Arabia are involved. But somehow there seems to be a massive change going through the international system. And I think a huge question mark is how that change will pan out. So will there be a completely new economic system? For example, what China, and now here we go to the uh, Chinese elites, Chinese political leadership, uh, Communist Party, Chinese government. What they're obviously try to make of this situation is to push forward with uh, the Belt and Road centered uh, new kind of model of of world cooperation as they see the traditional united nations based um, rule-based order is failing obviously neither russia nor the us care much about following the rules they once uh, set up uh, 80 years ago so that system is failing as well as the imf the dollar-based economic system is failing so it's time for a new system and um, if that works out, obviously, that would be a huge change in, in the uh, geopolitical setup of the world. And we could say because the new setup would then be more China centered, at least economically, whereas politically it would be multipolar, um, that would definitely be a huge win for the Chinese uh, as compared to a system that's very US centered with the US uh, having excessive amounts of power globally to influence any global decisions so that could be something but it could also go the other way if if uh, in the end the, the dollar hegemony is is too strong and and countries will stop trading with russia and and russia breaks uh, even you know if if putin falls that would um, be very negative for the Chinese leadership. Having a, a non-friendly pro-American leader allowing the US to set up bases at the Chinese northern border, that would be a horrible scenario for Chinese leadership. Um, for the common people, I think this is something that most common Chinese don't really 
follow that closely. Like the, the dollar hegemony is is quite a complex topic, and most people live their lives, you know, not internationally. Uh, it's same in any big country. Most Americans never have traveled abroad. Most Chinese never have traveled abroad. Most Chinese do business internally inside China. So for them, I think that's not a huge uh, uh, question or topic. But obviously, it will impact them nonetheless, whether they know it or not. So, so we cannot say it doesn't impact them at all. Um, for for businesses who are active globally, there's there's two kinds of of businesses. I'd say like the the typical export oriented businesses, they do trade towards the U.S. and Europe most of all, and for them, no matter how the the dollar uh, the importance of the dollar plays out. It will be very challenging for them if if um, these tensions between Russia and the West uh, expand towards extend towards uh, the West versus China. Uh, so there's a lot of talk on whether exports towards the U.S. and and Europe will be further restricted. If there will be more sanctions, more more tariffs, and so for those international businesses, that's very uncomfortable. And um, I'm sure leaders of such large corporations are quite worried about what will happen next. There's another type of international businesses in China, which are those that have already focused on Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia, the typical Belt and Road countries. Uh, classic example is, is, a, is a Chinese cell phone maker. They, they make this brand Techno, which is uh, huge in Africa. It has like a massive market share of cell phones in Africa. And um, yeah, for them, that's not a big worry. Also Huawei, for example, they've already been cut out of the US market, so they don't need to worry too much about further sanctions from the US. And um, on the contrary, they may reap some benefit if there's a new economic setup of the world where the developing countries get closer together and kind of throw off this 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 uh, focus on the us and europe so there could be some uh, potential upside as well for for those businesses if we look at the long term <laughs> i guess so here's another group of people looking <laughs> if we look at the long term uh, implications I have to say, it's very hard to make predictions at the moment. I think I'll revisit this after a month or two, because the sentiment here is that by the end of April, the fog of war will kind of start clearing up. The, the war itself will probably end, and it will become more clear whether after the end of the war, sanctions will be lifted. I mean how is continental Europe hoping to, to survive this and next year if, if they really uh, reject buying oil and gas from Russia in ruble? As, uh, for example, German Chancellor Scholz is, is currently saying, I cannot imagine how that is supposed to work. So, so there's a possibility that once the fighting ends, once uh, Zelensky ends up uh, surrendering and signing a peace deal, that there will be more, um, the sanctions will be at least reduced. Um, or, yeah, we'll, we'll see. But I think the sentiment is generally in, in, in like May, there will be much more clarity on what happens long term. I think generally China is cautiously optimistic that in the long run, like five years, 10 years from now, no matter what the short term detours and challenges are, in the long run, China will be the biggest economy. And once that's happened, the world will automatically and gradually shift towards becoming a more uh, China-centered world. So this is the very, like, we, we call it materialist approach, not in the, not in the <laughs> ethical sense, but in the, in the Marxist sense, like the material uh, historic outlook. So... So economic material economy determines the, the, the superstructure of, of, of society, the culture and everything. And once China is the most advanced, the most rich and the most economically powerful country, 
a lot of um, soft power will gradually gradually move towards uh, China because just whoever does business will want to do it with China. Uh, most advanced technology will be coming from China. There's a lot of optimism in that respect in China and I share this optimism. I mean, if you see like the way Chinese companies are innovating, the way uh, Chinese highly educated Chinese engineers, uh, scientists uh, and, and all kinds of uh, like white collar workers are, are uh, you know, really digging in to make fast, rapid progress. It's hard to imagine the West can keep up. And I mean, I understand that many people in the West are quite worried about you know, workers' rights and, and having this relaxed uh, 36 or 40 hours work week and, and just having a rather chilled out life with a very high salary. And of course, we want to protect these good working conditions, but <laughs> people in China are just willing to work a lot more for a lot less. And um, we cannot force them not to. Uh, I mean, yeah, some people are trying to force them. And I also hope, and I see it too, I mean, it's the, the working conditions in China are gradually improving, of, of course, um, and, and young Chinese have much higher demands re regarding free time, regarding uh, incomes, regarding hobbies that they want to pursue. But overall, Chinese society is still just moving, advancing much faster than, than the Western society. So, and, and, and irrespective of that, I mean, just the size of the population in China, if China reaches a quarter of the average incomes of the American in average incomes, then the Chinese economy will be bigger than the American economy. So uh, I have no doubt that this is going to happen. So in the long term, in sh short, getting back to the topic, I think in the long term, this war will be seen as an inflection point where things have shifted visibly and dramatically, but it's not a material change of direction. The long term direction of China becoming the strongest economic power in the world and gradually becoming the center of at least Eurasia and Africa that is a trend that's been going on and that will not be disturbed by this crisis. So it will just be one more crisis after, you know, a financial crisis, a dot-com bubble burst and, and all these crises that have happened before uh, from the 90s until now in these 30 years. China has just gradually become stronger and stronger due to good governance, a focus on education, focus on investment, on material investment into a real economy. And that trend's gonna continue. So what does that mean for the West? I think the West has two choices. It can act like a petulant child, child not accepting that China is becoming stronger, trying to stay on top. And that's basically an imperialist approach. You can only at one point use violence to try to keep China down or try to disrupt the society from within and, and, you know, achieve civil war inside of China to disrupt the further development. Or the West can, you know, get away from this, get back to where we were, I think, like 20 years ago, where we we're trying to, to work positively, cooperatively with China. Although we have to now accept that they're not going to choose our political system, especially during COVID, the Western political system has not performed in a way that would convince many Chinese to adopt a similar system for China. So we shouldn't have the illusion that we are vastly superior in any way. I always hear people say like, yeah, but they're not free. They're oppressed. No, they're not oppressed. You know, Chinese don't feel oppressed. They don't have certain liberties that we have. They have certain other liberties that we don't have, especially when it comes to, to women feeling safe uh, in the evening. Uh, it's a different system, but it's the system that Chinese are used to, that they grew up with, and that has worked really well for the vast majority of Chinese. So 
uh, you see, I, <laughs> I get to many other topics that I should do many other videos about. I'll go step by step. Today, I just wanted to say, uh, regarding the Ukraine crisis, will that help or not help China? I think in the short and midterm, it depends on who you are in Chinese society. You may be a bit more worried, a bit less worried. There is a potential that this crisis will improve China's standing. Typically, like if you're not involved in a war between two sides, in this case, the West and Russia, then you can continue de to develop, where, where as they get interrupted in their further development. But as the US has still very much power globally, um, so I, I'm not sure how much negative impact will come onto China. And I think a lot of Chinese also worry about this uh, because although many Chinese loathe American interference into China and, and this arrogance of the Americans telling the Chinese how they should govern themselves, at the same time, most Chinese also very much respect how the American-centered world order has allowed China to rise peacefully, to rise economically without having to defend itself militarily. And um, there is some sentiment of being thankful for that towards the US, despite everything that's happened in recent years, all the tension, there is still the sentiment of the US has established a global system that allowed China to rise and become strong again, as opposed to 150, 200 years ago when the Europeans militarily attacked China and, and you know, destroyed and, and stole resources from a China that was already flailing, that was already getting weaker and internal uh, problems made China unable to defend itself. Just stopping here to admire these beautiful flowers on this tree. And um, yeah, I think I've rambled enough. I've made the points that I've wanted to make. And with that, giving you a short view of this park uh, near my home in Beijing, I'll end this video. Thanks for staying with me and um, looking forward to seeing you in my next video. Please like and share if you enjoy these kind of videos. Please comment also positively or negatively. Thank you and peace.